stay home, which is fine as well. Good news is it's going to be um, live streamed on uh, Facebook, and then um, it will be on our YouTube channel. So if anybody says, darn, I missed it, they're going to have another chance to see it. Um, and then also, um, you'll see it um, five questions, follow-up questions in the Concord Monitor within the next month. So I'm here today just to do one thing that is like actually my favoriteest thing to do. So our former COO, Joe Conley, when we were going through H1N1 preparations, taught me the correct way to use hand sanitizer. And I am pleased to share that with you today, because you may not all know. So you, of course, put a dollop in your palm of your hand, don't forget to put a dollop in, if you can get hand sanitizer. OK, this is the thing I bet you don't know. Fingernails. Yes, fingernails. Under the icky, ick. But think about the things under your fingernails. So you first put your fingernails in, and then you put it on the other. Whoops. And hope it doesn't drip on the floor. <laughs> and then you do the other fingernails. Have you ever been talking? Yes, I've done it before. And Years. then you oh, wipe and wipe and wipe <laughs> in between, in between, until it dries. Did you know this, Dr. Halliwell? No. <laughs> so I taught you something you didn't know. So please uh, stay safe. Use your hand sanitizer. I'd like to introduce Tia Teriak. She is a trust associate. She is the leader for all of our What's Up Docs, and she will introduce our speaker. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, with St. Patrick's Day coming up, I put a little green into the room. So for all of those who are Irish uh, or Irish at heart, have a uh, wonderful St. Patrick's Day celebration. Um, I am very pleased to introduce today's um, presentation for What's Up Doc. Um, this has been a long anticipated presentation. I know that there are a lot of people that were not able to join us today, so that does uh, make us feel really good about the fact that we do our uh, Facebook streaming and then we do have uh, everything archived on uh, the YouTube channel of the hospital. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ari Salas. Dr. Salas attended Rutgers Medical School. He completed his residency at the University of Maryland Medical School and then completed a fellowship at the Indiana University Medical Center. Dr. Salas is board certified by the American Board of Radiology in both diagnostic radiology as well as vascular interventional radiology. Dr. Salas joined the staff in 2015, and he has offices both here uh, at the hospital at uh, 250 um, Pleasant Street and also an office at Two and a Half Beacon Street in Concord. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ari Salas. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. Yeah, so the last time I gave this presentation was about four years ago. Uh, and I've been here for about five years, so at that time, uh, interventional radiology on campus was uh, pretty light, uh, but it's uh, really changed in the past few years. We now have a staff of about 20 people. Uh, we have two rooms. We're expanding with a new room uh, shortly where it'll be a combined uh, operative room and an interventional suite, and we'll have a minor room too. And as mentioned, we have a, an office that we didn't have four years ago. Uh, so interventional is really blossoming here at, at Concord Hospital. So today what we're going to mostly talk about is uh, venous disease and varicose veins. Uh, but before we get into that, I, I just wanted to kind of educate everybody about what an interventional radiologist is. Mm -hmm. So most people know what a radiologist is. You know, a radiologist is a physician that uses imaging to determine a diagnosis. And what we have here at Concord is radiographic imaging, CT imaging, <coughs> ultrasound, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and nuclear medicine. And so these are all the uh, different modalities that a radiologist uses in to help uh, figure out what's going on with a patient when they're sick. The difference between a radiologist and an interventional radiologist is we take it one step further and instead of just diagnosing disease processes, we actually treat them. And so we use image guidance to perform non-surgical procedures 
to treat a whole sort of disease processes. So interventional radiologists are the doctors that actually created uh, stenting, like uh, what people usually know in the heart and putting stents in the heart. That was invented by interventional radiology. Uh, and it was used a lot in the legs. And uh, there's been several uh, disciplines that now use interventional radio radiology techniques uh, in different service lines throughout the hospital. So to become an interventional radiologist, it's four years of college, four years of medical school, and the traditional pathway was that you would do a year of internship, either a medicine internship or a surgical internship, and then you would do four years of radiology residency, and then a one to two year fellowship in interventional radiology. Uh, in the past several years, uh, interventional radiology has now become its own specialty. And so training has changed a bit where the traditional route is going to be phased out by the end of the summer. And to become an interventional radiologist, you would do three years of diagnostic radiology and then two years of interventional radiology. And then you wouldn't need to do a fellowship. So it's still a long time. It's still 15 years. So the main object of being an interventional radiologist is to determine different ways to treat uh, many disease processes that have been traditionally been treated by surgical means. And so what we try to do is minimally invasive image-guided procedures to decrease the risk of the procedure, decrease the complications, uh, less downtime for the patient, so there's fewer hospital stays, less recovery time, and then one of the big goals is to have equal or improved outcomes compared to the previous procedures. So the way I like to describe it, and probably people on Facebook that are surgeons might not be too happy about this, or even in a room, but I, I, when I try to describe it to people, I say it's kind of like surgery without the mess. So no big incisions, not, not a, a significant amount of post-operative complications, less than pain and trauma with the actual procedures, so less downtime, patients are back to doing the, their daily function uh, with minimal hospital stay. So, you know, as my, my daughter said, you know, I would I'd say, you know, what's the term now used for cool? Uh, she says now it's dope, but I think we'll just stick to cool. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I like interventional radiology is that there's, there's no boundaries. Uh, what I do is I treat with a specific image-guided procedure, so I'm not really tied to a body part. So there's times where I could be treating and um, destroying a, a cancer in somebody's kidney, and then the next procedure I'll do is like a thyroid biopsy uh, or work on a leg to open up a blood vessel. So there's really no limitation in body parts. It's really just the technique, and if I could determine a way to to uh, provide a better service to treat a disease process using my techniques, then interventional radiology can do that. I enjoy the fact that a lot of what we do is uh, instant gratification, where if somebody uh, presents, some, we do a lot of trauma work, where somebody presents with some bleeding after a trauma and they're coming in and uh, their blood pressure is very low and you can see they're actively bleeding, we can instantaneously stop the bleeding and you see their blood pressure stabilize and their heart rate stabilize and that's very gratifying uh, to see that immediate effect. And one of the big things is I've been doing interventional radiology for about 20 years uh, and it's been constantly changing. It changes so much with uh, technology and that's something that we'll discuss today about some of the procedures that we've been doing for varicose veins. It's, um, it's very exciting how I'd say in the past five years, I, I'm now doing things that, that I wasn't doing before in interventional radiology, just with the new procedures that we have. So why is it tough? So some of the same reasons that it's, it's good is, is also difficult for, for uh, public awareness, because we're not really tied to a body part. So like my mother doesn't still understand what I do. Oh, yeah. She just says, why don't you just uh, read x-rays in a dark room instead of doing procedures? 
and my dad doesn't get it either, uh, and a lot of the public doesn't really understand it either, because we're not tied to a body part. Like if, if a patient has an issue with a bone, they're going to go see an orthopedic surgeon. You know, if you have a stomach issue, you're going to know to say, okay, I have to see a gastroenterologist. But you don't really have an interventional issue. So it's, it's hard sometimes for the public to, to realize the, the capabilities of interventional radiology. So it, that's why I do talks like this to kind of make people aware of, of what we can do and how we can add choices to treatment options. So this is a, a, a group of some of the things that, that we've been doing and how we've changed uh, management of, of patients. Uh, one is abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, before uh, treatment with interventional uh, techniques, uh, you, a patient would have a, a big uh, incision across their entire abdomen. They'd be hospitalized for several days. There'd be an increased risk of morbidity and mortality with those surgeries. Uh, and I'll show you, you know, what we do now. Uh, cancer treatments, uh, I mentioned something before where we do kidney ablation, uh, where we can go ahead and instead of operating on the patient, we can put a small probe into the lesion and under CT guidance, we can go ahead and freeze the tumor and destroy the tumor. And the data has showed that that's equally, if not more effective than uh, conventional treatments like surgery. Uh, in the past, when somebody developed an abscess, they would have to have a, uh, a surgery and have to have like a laparotomy or an incision to go ahead and remove the collection. Now, using ultrasound and CT guidance, we're able to place a small needle right into that area, and then we put a wire into the abscess and then a small little tube to drain it out. So that's significantly changed the management of patients with uh, abscesses. Infertility. Uh, I do something called fallopian tube rate canalization, where if the fallopian tubes are blocked, I could use a little wire in, in a balloon and open up the vessel, the fallopian tube, so that it, it dramatically increases the chance of fertility. Uh, we do a, a lot of biopsies for uh, cancer diagnosis, and um, we do them usually with CT or ultrasound or even MRI guidance. In pelvic pain, uh, which is similar to what we'll be talking about soon about uh, venous disease, but some patients develop venous disease in their pelvis, and we use uh, small coils under x-ray guidance to deposit these coils to <coughs> close down those veins and to eradicate the pain. Uh, spine fractures in patients that have osteoporosis and that develop compression fractures, we can go ahead and do a procedure called kyphoplasty, where we put cement into the spine to decrease the pain, to dramatically decrease the patient's downtime, uh, and that's been a procedure that we've been doing for years here. Uh, varicose veins, which we'll get into. Uh, women's health, we treat uh, benign tumors in the uterus, where we go ahead and put small little uh, particles into the blood vessels, which then shrink those fibroids down, uh, so the patients don't require hysterectomy. Uh, and then trauma is one of the reasons that I'm here today, is I was recruited because we are a level two trauma center here at Concord Hospital, and interventional is greatly involved in managing organ injury. So instead of a patient going uh, to surgery to have their spleen removed, we can go in with a small little catheter and put small little coils to stop the bleeding, to decrease the pressure so the bleeding stops, and so the patient maintains their spleen, does not have to go to the operating room, and they can be discharged in one to two days afterwards. So this is an example of the, the uh, aortic aneurysm case. So in the past, you know, a big time surgery, high risk, this patient was uh, actually 85 years old. And uh, so what you see here is the uh, a catheter that's in the aorta. You see these little markers coming down. And this is the iliac arteries. And here's the big aneurysm. It's kind of bilobed. And so then from this access that we have in the groin, we're able to put in wires. And then over those wires, we track a stent graft. Uh, it's called an aortic stent graft. And so here are the kidney arteries right here. And then we go ahead and deploy this. And this is the whole graft here. So you can see that it's bypassed. So now the flow is not being directed through the aneurysm. The aneurysm's on the outside. And the stent grafts inside the vessel and the flow is going through the stent graft. 
So the risk of aortic rupture is significantly decreased. And we do this through two accesses that we have in the groin that afterwards we put band-aids. So instead of a big time surgery that's uh, going ahead to put in a bypass graft, we're able to do it from incisions down at the groin. We can have patients going home the next day afterwards. You said that the aneurysm was on the outside. So did, did it, does it go away? So, it it will, so the aneurysm will go away because there's no pressure on the aneurysm anymore. Got it. So we don't remove the aneurysm. What we're doing is just putting a tube through the aneurysm itself. Mm -hmm. And so the aneurysm would be out here. And, but the, the actual flow from the heart coming down to the legs is through <coughs> the stent graft. And it reabsorbs over time. And it'll just shrink over time because there's no there's no pressure on the aneurysm, so it's not expanding anymore. So it shrinks over time, and then we monitor it uh, with CT imaging. How much time? How much time do you expect it to shrink? Uh, how much time? How much time will it not shrink? Oh, it, well, the the aneurysm, the risk of rupture once we go ahead and put this is is extremely low because there's no pressure on the aneurysm anymore, and then over time it, it will shrink down. Um, but the, the fact that there's no more pressure on the aneurysm, the, the, the risk of rupture is significantly decreased. So uh, another uh, just interesting tidbit that we do is we can treat uh, liver cancer. And so what I'm showing you here in this uh, diagram are small liver lesions. Um, and this is typically we've done this with uh, colon cancer. And what we can do is we can bring a catheter up into the blood vessels that are supplying the liver cancer, and we put in uh, radiated uh, resin microspheres uh, with uh, the radiation is a, a beta uh, radiation, and it's yttrium-90. And so this is internal radiation. You know that you've heard of radiation for treatments for cancer to help to shrink the tumors and destroy the tumors. Well, we can do that internally, and that's what this procedure is. It's called radioembolization. And so we can direct these little microspheres into the blood vessels that are supplying the tumor. And what you see when we do that, uh, on the left side is a patient with multiple liver lesions that are on a PET scan. And so the, the areas that are active that demand a lot of energy typically are going to be bright on the PET scan, and that's what we're seeing here. These are those liver lesions. This is two months after the procedure. The liver lesions have now been killed. Is that a defibrillator up on the right-hand side? So that's there a port. The left? That's a port for chemotherapy. Ah, interesting. And then, yes, and this is the urinary bladder, and that, that's the kidneys there. Cool. So, but today we'll, we're going to talk mostly about venous disease, about varicose veins. And so in order to get a better understanding about varicose veins, you have to really know the anatomy. So the anatomy of the leg is there's two uh, venous systems of the leg. There's the deep and the superficial. So the veins are bringing the blood back up to the heart. That's the goal of the veins. That's what we want them to do. Uh, and the arteries bring the blood down to supply the muscles and the bones and the tissues of the leg. So this diagram here uh, shows the anatomy of the superficial system, and that's the great saphenous vein, and that's right here. And then there's the deep system, uh, which is the femoral vein, and up here is the common femoral vein, and then it runs down and becomes the popliteal vein here, and then it branches into uh, tibial and posterior tibial veins. And then the back of the leg, it's a little different. So there's a small or short saphenous vein that arises from the um, popliteal vein. So the, the deep anatomy is pretty standard in most patients. Most people have the same deep anatomy. There's a minor variability. With the superficial veins, there's a lot of variability. So it makes it kind of exciting when your uh, patients come in and we're evaluating for uh, venous disease, typically what we're looking at is superficial disease, and we're looking at their anatomy, but a lot of patients are variable. So it's important to know that there is that uh, variability when we're seeing these patients in the office. So this is a really good slide because it shows the pathophysiology of venous disease. So the problem with venous disease 
is that instead of the blood going back up to the heart, the blood is pooling. It's pooling in the uh, veins and it's being directed uh, down instead of heading back up. And that's what this diagram here is showing. So this is a saphenofremal junction. This is the junction between the deep vein and the superficial vein. And in patients that have abnormal valves, everybody has valves in their vein. And when you walk and you squeeze the muscles in your calf, it pushes the blood up the veins and kind of gets trapped by the valves. And you kind of keep, when you keep walking and contracting your muscles, it kind of moves up and then traps again until the blood leaves out into the, uh, and goes to the heart. But patients that have faulty vein valves, what will happen is the blood is heading down instead of going back up to the heart. And so this is an example of what happens. So the blood's going to pool, and the veins go ahead and they dilate, and you can develop varicose veins. And so the, the, when we see varicose veins, and you see them in, in patients, that's really the tip of the iceberg. The issue is not so much the, the varicose veins. The issue is because the faulty valves that are causing the, the blood to pool. So you'll see varicose veins, they can develop off the vessel and then they usually tend to go be more superficial and that's why we can see them right, right adjacent underneath the skin. Other uh, venous issues that you can have are spider veins, small spider veins that you'll see, um, and I'll have a picture of it later, uh, that are just right on the skin surface. Another important concept is that, you know, I told you before, there's two systems. There's a deep and a superficial system, but they're not isolated. They communicate. And so there's something called a perforating vein that communicates. And there's several of these along the, the venous uh, system. And those also are involved when there are um, issues with the veins. Because what can happen is the blood can pool from... The, the deep system into the superficial system from this, these perforators. And so we have to keep a good eye on these when we go ahead and treat so that, to know where these are because sometimes if this is further down and you go ahead and treat the vein above, then you're still going to run into problems with uh, venous disease even after treatment. So factors causing varicose veins, hereditary, um, it's one of the big questions that we ask, and it's something that we usually hear from our patients, that there's usually a family history of venous disease. Uh, the reason why the valves can be damaged, it can be from obesity, uh, pregnancy, age, uh, the pliability of the valves. As you get older, they, they tend to maybe sometimes get off a little bit, so then they can leak. Uh, and then we see it in, in patients that have had trauma to the veins. Uh, standing for long periods of time. I've treated many patients that are teachers, that work in the supermarket, that are factory workers uh, on concrete. Uh, the data is kind of mixed, but I think there's definitely a, uh, an association with being on your feet for a long period of time. So symptoms. So when you think about varicose veins, a lot of times people just say, oh yeah, uh, I just have these little bulging veins, but they're not really giving me any issues. Uh, but you'd be surprised because the majority of the time they do cause symptoms. Uh, the symptoms can be aching and pain. They can have a heavy feelingness in the legs, throbbing sensation, uh, fatigue. Most patients complain of fatigue at the end of the day. Uh, restless legs, uh, charley horses or cramps, uh, itching. Because uh, as I mentioned before, the varicose veins get, become superficial. And so they're pushing against the skin, and they're eroding the skin. Uh, so that can cause itching and irritation, and even what we'll see later, developing ulcers. And the big thing that I wanted to, to stress here is that uh, because of the, the techniques and the way that we can go ahead and treat venous disease, uh, there, there's no real limitation about age and, and who we can treat. And if patients are symptomatic, and, and symptoms do increase with patients' age, there, there's no limitation. Uh, the, the procedures that we do now are so minimally invasive uh, that the, uh, the risk of the procedures are, are so low compared to the benefit if some patients are symptomatic from venous disease. So this is the big thing that, you know, the end stage of venous disease is venous stasis ulcers. And that's, the, that's one of the um, 
big reasons that I've been so uh, active here at Concord Hospital is because we have a, a wound care clinic, and so I've been uh, greatly involved in treating venous stasis ulcers. Um, but it's important to treat uh, even before you develop venous stasis ulcers. You know, venous disease is progressive, so you're going to see patients that, that may start off with mild disease, uh, and not everybody progresses, but a lot of people do. And so if there are symptoms, it's best to go ahead and treat before you get into a situation where you develop uh, an ulcer or something like, like this. So there was a recent article from the NIH says, they think about 60% of the adult population have some form of venous disease. And so you'll have patients that have you know, varicose veins like this, or swelling, you can see the dramatic difference between you know, the, the right leg here and the left leg. Uh, skin changes, something called lipodermatosclerosis, where it's not clearly understood, but most people say that it's related to venous insufficiency, and it causes fat necrosis and uh, inflammatory reaction, and so the skin becomes very tight and discolored, and, and so that we see this in a lot of our patients. And then again, like I mentioned before, uh, venous stasis ulcers. So varicose veins are increasing in the population. Uh, it's projected about a 6.3% increase by 2025. And a lot of that has to do with the aging population. So when we see patients in the office, uh, we use a certain classification system in order to um, kind of keep everything uh, straight and organized in our office. And so like I mentioned before, uh, we have uh, spider veins, so they're superficial, you know, they're called here telangic tages, uh, but most people call these spider veins, and you'll see these, uh, you know, most, mostly coming out of a reticular vein and then out into the skin. And then, you know, the varicose veins, um, which um, most patterns are typically where they'll be on the inside of the calf, where you can see them running down the thigh. Uh, and then you can also have them in the back of the leg. Uh, chronic edema, or swelling of the leg. The pigmentation changes that we discussed before. Uh, and uh, a patient that's a, a healed ulcer would be categorized as class five. And then we have the, the venous ulcer. And so we treat in our office the whole spectrum. We treat spider veins all the way to venous stasis ulcer. So venous stasis ulcers, the most common cause of those ulcers, 60 to 70 percent, is venous disease. So we are really critical in managing these patients, and we are very closely associated with our wound care service here for, for treating these patients. But you can see there are other causes too, but the big culprit is venous insufficiency. So in the United States, you know, I, I told you 60%, that's a lot of patients with venous disease, but they're undertreated. Uh, and, um, you know, here, even here at Concord, uh, there's plenty of times where I see patients where they have venous stasis ulcers, but they've complained all their life of having venous issues and swelling and throbbing veins, um, but, you know, we get to them late. So it's, it's a good idea to just educate everybody to let people know that there are procedures that we can do uh, so that the disease does not progress. Now the big thing that, that I wanted to show you was just in the bottom here. So the gold standard for treating venous disease, maybe about, I'd say about 15 years ago, uh, was stripping. So it's a surgical procedure uh, requiring anesthesia, usually a hospital stay. And that was the gold standard. So when I first started doing this talk, that number was about 250,000. I started doing uh, venous disease treatments uh, pretty much back in 2004. Uh, this is uh, recent data. So now, in the United States, only 25,000 uh, vein strippings are done nationally. So it's a dramatically decrease. So the gold standard is not the gold standard anymore. The new gold standard is what we're going to get into now. So why would you do, excuse me, Josh, why would you do a vein stripping? Why is it even in existence? Well, there's still... I mean, is there a reason you strip the veins versus doing a, a, a 
categorization operator. Yeah, there, there's still some um, positions that are still proponents of, of doing stripping, uh, but it's it's significantly decreased. Uh, you know, it's still you know sometimes when you you, you go to a, a surgeon, you get a knife. You know, so it, it's just uh, that's just the way. You know, sometimes it's why it's good to be publicly aware about these different options uh, for, for what you have. So when you have a disease process, you know, you can educate yourself about some of the indications and treatments, and you talk to your physician and ask about different options about how to how to treat different disease processes. So in order to find if somebody's a candidate for, for moving forward with an interventional radiology procedure, it, we do an ultrasound examination, and we're looking at venous reflux. We're looking at blood going the opposite direction, so extending distally down the leg versus going up. And so we test the valves. We stress the valves. We have the patient stand, and we go ahead and we squeeze the, the leg, and then we see the response of the vein. So if you have normal valves, the, the response should be reflexive where there's not a lot of flow going back down. And so it should be less than 0.5 seconds, and that's the normal valve function. But if you have significant reflux, then what we're going to see is we're going to see blood flow going the opposite direction, where the valves are not able to trap the blood, and instead the, the blood flow goes the opposite way. So this is an ultrasound examination and showing you the greater saphenous vein, GSV. And it kind of sits in a compartment that's called the saphenous compartment. Most people say it looks like uh, an eyeball. Uh, this is seen where we're kind of slicing it uh, transversely, like, a, like how you would slice a, um, a loaf of bread. And so we'll go ahead and study this vein. This is usually the most common vein that uh, results in uh, symptomatic uh, varicose veins. And so we'll map this out under ultrasound. And here's a, how we undergo the reflux. So this point right here is where we went ahead and we squeezed the cap. And once we, we went ahead and did that, the response was negative. It was reflux. So this is a long duration of reflux where the blood is going the opposite way. So this you would call significant venous insufficiency. So I mentioned a little bit about surgery. So it was typically an overnight stay, uh, significant discomfort. Uh, there is be uh, a lot of incision sites, uh, recovery anywhere from four to six weeks. Uh, the procedure would be done with anesthesia in the operating room, so high surgical cost. And you know now what we do here is something called endovenous laser ablation. So we do it as an outpatient. It's a 45-minute procedure. There's minimal discomfort. There's no downtime. Uh, patients are back to the, doing their, their normal function. I've had plenty of patients that have had the procedure on a Thursday and are golfing that weekend. So the first thing, as I mentioned, is we map. So we, we're going ahead and we determine where the most distal aspect of the venous reflux is. And so that's where we want to go ahead and access the vein, so that we want to cover the entire length of where the vein is faulty. And once we mark that course, then we go ahead and we'll have the patient lay down, and we'll use ultrasound, and we'll gain access into the vein. So we put a little wire in. The access is very small. It's uh, probably about a half a centimeter in length. Uh, and then a small little sheath or tube then gets advanced up to the junction where I mentioned before between the deep and the superficial vein. And then what we do is we use tumescent anesthesia so that we put uh, a solution of fluid and we inject it along the vein. And the main reason for that is so that we can compress the vein so that when we place the laser in there, there's going to be good coverage. Uh, we protect other structures from injury and it numbs up that whole area so nobody's going to feel any discomfort when we turn the laser on. And it also decompresses the vein so that, again, we can get good coverage. And the important thing here on the bottom is just that we, we 
we want to keep a, a distance of at least a centimeter from the skin and the vein. For patients that are real thin, we might put in some more fluids to decrease the risk of any burns in the skin. So this is uh, the laser that we use here, uh, VenaCure. Uh, it's made from angiodynamics. Uh, when I first started doing this, I used a laser uh, that was uh, 980 nanometers, and now we use a laser that's 1470 nanometers. So lasers have been used a lot in uh, medicine, and uh, these are all the different fields that have used lasers. I've used lasers in the past to break up uh, gallstones for patients that are not uh, candidates for having a surgically removed gallbladder. I could go in with a small laser and break up the stones and extract them. Uh, so it's something that I, where I've used lasers in the past before I started doing it for varicose veins. So this is the device that we have. This is our generator. And so the way it works is the laser, go ahead and heats up the plasma, the water in the blood. And when that creates a steam bubble, that energy and heat destroys the lining of the vein. And when it causes that to destroy, it causes a little bit of uh, blood clot in there too, and vessel occlusion, and it limits um, any significant injury to outside structures because of the laser is a small diameter. So it's just covering the vein itself. The reason why we switched to the 1470 is that it's uh, been proven to give uh, less um, bruising uh, after the procedure. So it's been very effective. And I've been using it here since I've been here. So the kit that we have comes with a sheet that I mentioned first uh, before. This is the first thing that'll go in. Uh, and then there, it'll go over this wire. Uh, this is the actual laser device here. Uh, and so the, these are the, uh, this is the equipment that we'll use under ultrasound guidance in order to perform the procedure. And so what we'll do is we advance the catheter up to the level of that junction. We put in the laser device, numb up all along the area, turn the laser on, then we slowly pull back the laser so that we can generate an energy about 50 to 80 joules a centimeter. So while we're doing the procedure, we'll be calling out the energy level. It's not how much the procedure costs, it's just the energy <laughs> level. Yeah, and uh, when we're done, we go ahead and we, we take the catheter out. And then the patients uh, will go ahead and we'll apply the compression stocking. We'll wear the compression stocking for 24 hours straight and then they wear it for six days. We'll get an ultrasound in a week to make sure that what we treated is shut down and that everything else is open because that's the biggest risk here is a deep vein thrombosis or blood clot in the deep system. So this is just a, a diagram kind of going through uh, what I just talked about. So the sheath would go up, that green uh, color is the sheath, and then once we get it up there, then we go ahead and we pass the laser back down. And typically we, we treat at the knee, but we can even treat lower down. So when, we, when I first started doing this, we were concerned because there's a nerve that sits really close to the uh, vein as you get below the knee. And so there's a concern that we could damage that nerve. So there is a slight increase of, of risk of damaging that nerve, uh, but it's pretty low. And what we do is we use that tumescent anesthesia, that fluid to separate the nerve away from the vein so that we can go ahead and just treat the vein and nothing else. But it, just remember that part about the nerve because you'll see there's some new developments that we don't have to worry about that nerve anymore. This is just an ultrasound picture showing uh, this is the laser uh, and right here would be um, just about the junction of the saphenous vein and the femoral vein and so I'm just showing how visible we can see the uh, lasers. So that's why we do this. We don't do it with any x-ray imaging. It's all done uh, with ultrasound guidance. So patients will come back to the office in four to six weeks. 
Usually patients will see significant relief in two to three days after la the laser procedure, and you'll see physical, physical improvements about four weeks afterwards. Uh, sometimes there's residual varicose veins, like I mentioned before, sometimes there's sneaky perforators that we don't see initially, but after we treat the vein, they become more prominent, and so there are some other treatments that we can talk about now about other ways to treat if patients still have residual uh, symptoms in varicose veins. This is what the vein looks after treatment. So, you know, before you saw it was all black. Now it's filled in, it's non-compressible. That's what we want to look for when patients come back a week after to make sure that the vein is shut down. So this is a patient that we treated. This is her initial presentation. You can see the varicose veins in a pretty typical area. They're coming straight off the greater saphenous vein. And then this is four weeks after. We went ahead and treated, no other further intervention. And you can see a significant decrease in the, the varicosities and a significant improvement in their symptoms. So why do I do lasers? So there is another procedure out there called radiofrequency ablation. Also similar, thermal energy in destroying the vein. I, I do laser because I think it works better. And there's papers that prove that too. So here's a paper that kind of compared the two. And it showed that the radiofrequency group, the vein opened up about 6.8% of the time. But in the laser group, the vein didn't open up at all. They also said that you know, patients were more satisfied with the procedure with the laser than with the radiofrequency ablation. They're similar, but the new laser and the way it works and the, the bruising is diminished. Uh, I really think that if there's, a, if there's a choice between thermal energy treatments, that the laser is the best way to go. So complications. So the, the one big one that we look out for is deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and in studies, it's been anywhere from zero to one percent. Uh, here at our, our institution, it, the number is probably closer to 0.1 percent. Uh, we don't see it too often. We've been doing this for a long period of time. So, uh, you know, it, I think sometimes if you get too close to the deep vein, that's when you run into issues. Paresthesias, like I mentioned before. The nerves kind of can sit next to the vein, so it can get irritated when you do the laser treatment and the, and the energy that's being used in order to destroy the, the vein can cause irritation and damage to the nerve. So paresthesia would be pins and needles. Sometimes people will say, I'm feeling a little bit of pins and needles. Uh, usually it goes away in about two to three months. I've never had a patient that, that had it where it continued. Um, one of the big things that we do is try to separate the nerve uh, from the, the vein, but as we'll, you'll see, there are some other procedures where if we're going to go ahead and treat somebody that has disease that's below their knee, there's other options now where we don't have to use thermal energy. And so if you don't use thermal energy, then you're not having any real risk to the nerve. Hyperpigmentation, sometimes see it in patients that are really thin. Uh, that'll develop a little bit of staining uh, at the site of where we go ahead and treat along the skin uh, that generally fades in two to three months. And so the occlusion rate, so how effective it is. So in the studies, 88 to 100% of the time, the vein closes down. So why is it a big deal for uh, venous stasis ulcers? Like I mentioned before, 60 to 70% of the time, venous disease is the culprit behind why patients get ulcers. So there was a recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at treatment, and it showed that if you go ahead and you treat, when a patient first presents with venous stasis ulcer, if you go ahead and treat first, they're going to heal faster than if you treat after. So 56 days versus 82 days. The other important thing is that they're going to be also free. I mentioned before, venous disease is progressive, so there's still a small chance that these patients can develop more ulcers. When you go ahead and you treat first, the, the chance of that happening is much less. So this is something that I, you know, been working hand in hand with the uh, wound care clinic. So when patients present, you know, if we go ahead and treat and close down the veins that are responsible for their venous stasis ulcers, they're going to heal quicker. So another procedure that's in my tool bag is ambulatory phlebectomy. 
And so this is a, a minimally invasive way to remove segmental varicose veins that maybe are not communicating with uh, the greater saphenous or the short saphenous vein. So these are uh, veins that may be coming off a perforating branch or an accessory vein. And so the, what we can do is we use, it's also not uh, uh, in, uh, in, a in a surgical center, uh, it's in an outpatient office where we numb up the area and we use a small phlebectomy set and we remove segments of these veins, tiny incisions along the vein to remove it, uh, and it's been very effective. But there's some new ways that we can go ahead and treat these veins now uh, that we'll get into because you're still making incisions. There's still a small risk of infection at those incisions. There's still uh, a chance of bruising. Um, patients are aware of compression stocking a week after, and we usually follow them up in three months. <coughs> so I typically use this for uh, perforating veins or accessory veins that are causing varicose veins. Uh, this is a, just a picture of, of it happening with some uh, artistic lighting. And, uh, <laughs> you can see, uh, you know, we go ahead and make a tiny incision. I don't know how well everybody can see that. Uh, but we're removing segments where once we grab the vein, we kind of grab it from the top and grab it from the, the bottom and, uh, and able to remove segments. And then we kind of move along the course of the vein so that we try to get out as much as possible. Uh, this is a diagram of, of what it kind of looks like. So the vein gets grabbed by our phlebectomy hook. Uh, before I came here, I was back in, uh, I had a vein practice in Virginia, and my phlebectomy hooks were crochet hooks from Michael's. They worked really well. Uh, when I came here, they got me a set, so I have a single set. So, uh, you know, it's been, it's been going pretty well, but this procedure that I've been doing uh, for quite some time has diminished because of some new developments. Um, another procedure that we can do for the smaller veins, the spider veins, is scleral therapy. And so we use sotradecol and uh, polydacanol. These are two sclerosin agents that cause irritation to those small little spider veins. And we do this in the office. Uh, it's a, about a 40 minute procedure where we'll go ahead and inject those veins. Uh, patients usually wear compression stocking for three days afterwards. The veins will get a little irritated initially, a little red, um, no real significant pain. Uh, and then what they'll do is then over a period of two weeks, they'll fade away. And it's been, uh, it's been really good. The bad side about everything else that we've been talking about is covered by insurance. With sclerotherapy, it's aesthetics. So it's not covered by insurance. But we have great pricing. <laughs> so, so new development. So for years, that's all I had in my tool bag. Sclerotherapy, ambulatory phlebectomy, and laser. And so if you had a vein problem, then it was, those were the top three that you know, we were going to use to treat. Um, but now there's, there's new uh, products out there that are, um, are really good and uh, have been proven to be effective. So this is one that I've been using a lot recently. It's called Venaseal. Uh, and it looks like a glue gun, because it is. <laughs> this is actually glue. Uh, and here it is here. And we go ahead and we, we would go ahead and use a syringe and attach the syringe to the, glun, the gun. And then the, the catheter gets directed up, uh, similar to the way that we do the laser procedure. So the, the actual glue is uh, cyanoacrylate. It's been used before medically. I've used it to treat uh, arterial venous malformations. So instead of undergoing surgery to remove a group of arteries and veins uh, that are abnormal communicating, instead of being a capillary bed, uh, they kind of join together. And if you try to remove that with surgery, it's a significant uh, morbidity because there's extensive bleeding. I've used glue to go ahead and close those, those artery and, uh, and vein uh, abnormal communications. Um, and I'm using glue now to treat for varicose veins. And so the way it works is it's an anionic substance, such as plasma or water. And it's when it's, the glue hits that, the glue goes ahead and it, it polymerizes. So it, it becomes hard. And it, 
creates a bond against the wall of the vein and causes an inflammatory reaction, a mild inflammatory reaction, and that seals the vessel. So it's almost identical in terms of type technique compared to the laser, where we're uh, looking for the most distal area of reflux, and that's where then we access the vein, and then we go ahead and we bring uh, the uh, sheath containing the glue, and then instead of numbing up the skin, we don't have to do that because we're not using thermal energy. We're not using anything that causes any discomfort. So we don't have to do that part of the procedure. And we use small aliquots of this glue, and every three centimeters, we go ahead and we hold pressure for about 30 seconds, and we just kind of work our way down all the way to the end of the uh, place where we access. Uh, so this has been really good because I could use this device for very long segments where I don't have to worry about any nerve issue. And then in my patients that are, remember I had that classification of, of one through five. And so patients that have venous ulcers and have skin disease that, where their skin is really tight and you don't want to inject a lot of fluid around there because it, there, there's uh, just so much uh, disease from the venous insufficiency, this is a, a great way to go ahead and treat patients instead. So the data. So this study looked at using venous seal and compared it to radiofrequency ablation. They were equal in closure, 97% in one year. But patients tolerated it much better, which you could see why. There's no thermal energy. There's no heat. So it, it worked so much better for patients. This is the big study that... Is radiofrequency ablation done at Concord Hospital? Yes. Okay, so it's a separate department, obviously. If I go to my primary care physician and I whine about my legs or something, how, what, is it up to my primary care to give me these options that are available, or how do I get to know you? How do you get to know me? Mm -hmm. uh, like this, like this. Like this. <laughs> And, uh, and hopefully that your, your primary physician. So at Concord Hospital, we're in the middle of unifying some of our vascular care. Okay. So there are, there are doctors here that are not interventional radiologists, you know, yeah, that are vascular here. surgeons, that, and we, we work together. Okay. And so the, the one thing about working together is that we, we do several of these procedures together, but interventional radiology was fundamentally um, developed using the laser for treatment of varicose veins. Other disciplines used radiofrequency ablation, such as vascular surgery. Uh, so there was some competing, but it's ideally it's about the same, the thermal work. But both vascular surgeons and interventional radiologists here do uh, both venous seal and um, thermal ablations. Just one group may do more radio frequency ablation. And the other question is, does anticoagulation therapy work with this? Is it put is that in conjunction with, or is it anticoagulation with so, what you do? Or is it I, a, I, I will get into that. So I don't really use anticoagulation unless I have to okay. at the end of, of the procedure. If a patient develops a deep vein thrombosis, that's when we would put them on a blood thinner. Um, but it's very unusual to do that. and. Uh, in my career, I've maybe put two patients on a blood thinner afterwards, and I've been doing this since 2003 or 4. Uh, but in terms of if patients are on anticoagulation prior to the procedure, we generally, depending on why they're on it, we determine that with their uh, primary doctors and see if we can go ahead and stop that anticoagulation for a period of time in order to do the procedure, just to decrease the bruising. In situations where patients still have to be on uh, blood thinner no matter what. I have done the procedure. There's a little bit more bruising, uh, but because we're so minimally invasive, it's, it's not like a, a big surgery where there's a high risk of bleeding. So this study from uh, 2015, where you know, a lot of times uh, new procedures are done in Europe, it's easier to get the procedures done out there than, than here. And so this study looked at venous seal, and this was a one-year study. And they saw that it was 93% of the time the vein shut down. Uh, there was some irritation, uh, something called phlebitis, uh, where I told you there's some mild inflammatory reaction, and some 15% of the patients had this mild. It usually lasted two to three days. 
and some mild pain for one day, 8% of the patients. No deep vein thrombosis. What they did notice is that sometimes it, the glue would kind of slightly move closer to that junction between the deep and the superficial vein. And when it, it did that, uh, you know, there's a smaller, there's a higher increased risk of developing a deep vein thrombosis. So from this initial study, now what we do is when we do the procedure, we stay five centimeters away from that junction so that if it creeps a little bit, we're already covered. So if, if the um, blood's getting to the toes still, but if you're blocking some of these uh, veins, you know, the blood's still got to get back. It just finds other routes? Correct. So if, if you have a vein where the blood is just pooling and going the wrong direction, it's not really helping. It's, uh, you know, it's the, the, the object of the vein is to send the blood back up to the heart. If it's pooling, it's not doing anything. Once we kind of shut that valve off, then everything gets redirected back into the deep system. I kind of explain to most of my patients it's kind of like a highway, like 93 and, and back, up, back roads. So if you, you know, if you wanted everybody to just travel 93, then you would go ahead and shut down the back roads, so then everybody's going to stay on 93 and head back you know, where they need to go. If you keep the back roads open, everybody's going to pool and stay in those back roads. So, so there's, there, that's the advantage of the two vein systems, so that we'll go ahead and we can treat the superficial veins, but leave the deep system. And a lot of times when we treat the superficial vein system, it increases the pressure and it increases the flow through the deep system. So even if you have reflux in the deep system, it's going to help and improve once you treat the superficial. So this is recent data, seven-year data now, <coughs> tracking venous seal. And so these patients, so 96% closure rate, you know, the advantage, no sensory deficits because you don't use thermal energy. You don't have to use a compression stocking. They're pretty tight. A lot of patients, uh, especially older patients, it's kind of hard. I don't know if, if anybody here wears compression stockings, but the ones that we use afterwards, they're 30-40 mmHg. So they're, they're pretty tight. So if you don't, you know, if you can get away from not using them, sometimes insurance companies don't cover them. And so that's another reason that, that this procedure works out good, that we don't have to use it. And then again, just like the, the initial paper, there's some mild temporary foreign body reaction. Uh, we've seen it in a few patients here. They'll get a little bit of redness, sometimes like a phlebitis. And I've treated with uh, ibuprofen, Advil. And that's helped, and usually for three or four days. And, and then that infl inflammation simmers down, uh, and uh, the patients are feeling much better. Uh, so this is what I was talking about before, where it can pooch into the deep vein. So the patients, when we see this on the ultrasound examination, these two groups we wouldn't treat. We wouldn't give any blood thinners. But if we see, if it gets to a point where it's 50% uh, into the common femoral vein, then we'll go ahead and treat with uh, blood thinners for a few weeks and then repeat the examination and make sure that this uh, goes away. And usually it does. So that, that was venous seal. So that's, that's one new way that I've been uh, treating patients. Uh, another way, FDA approved in 2013, is varathena. So this is foam sclerotherapy. So identical to the um, sclerotherapy that I use for the spider veins, but we mix it up in a foam. And the foam is made with uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. I used to do foam on my own, but I would use room air. And room air has nitrogen, and the nitrogen can cause some serious effects. So Years ago, I stopped using it, but now I'm back to using uh, Varathena because of the, the advantage of it, that it's mixed with carbon dioxide and oxygen. And so the idea behind it, you know, when you put in sclerotherapy in spider veins, they're small, so there's, there's enough where they're going to go ahead and cover the wall. But if you're doing it in larger veins, it's not going to go ahead and cover the entire surface of the vein, but that's the advantage of using uh, a foam is because now it's going to cover the entire surface and it's going to irritate and shut down the entire surface of the vein. So this has been uh, used uh, very actively in, in Europe. Uh, England's been using it a lot for uh, closing greater saphenous veins. Uh, and you can see this trial here is 85% uh, closure rate. Uh, and it's FDA approved to treat greater saphenous veins, accessory veins, and varicosities. 
So how I do, do I use this? So I'm using this in lieu of ambulatory phlebectomy. So instead of going ahead and doing multiple ins tiny incisions now, I'm able to go ahead and put a small little needle into the varicose veins and then inject the foam and then we hold pressure for about five minutes and we take the needle out and then patients go ahead and wear a compression stocking for two weeks. So this is an example uh, of varicose veins that you'll see on ultrasound examination and where they're coming from is a perforating branch to the deep system and that's what that is there. So I'll go ahead and uh, place a needle under ultrasound guidance right into this vein and then I'll have uh, one of my associates hold pressure so that the foam is just going to go into the veins themselves and not go into the perforating branch and into the deep system. This is what happens after the foam's in the vein. This is the actual foam. It's, uh, we call it hyperechoic, or it's, you know, it's bright on ultrasound examination, and it causes spasm to the vein, and then the foam is touching all of the surface of the vein, and it's irritating it, and it's closing it down. So the, the risk of this procedure, there's a small risk of deep vein thrombosis. This is in some of the earlier studies, 1.7%. Uh, no blood clots in the lungs. That's what some people were concerned about, was that you're going to be using a higher volume of foam. So potentially, if it doesn't stay where, it, where it's going to be into the veins, it can head up into the bloodstream and go to the lungs, but we didn't see it. no evidence of that, uh, no, no risk of stroke. Uh, and the downside, you know, there's always a downside. So the advantage of the ambulatory phlebectomy is the veins are gone. So once the bruising and those little incisions close, the veins are completely gone. Here, we go ahead and, you know, we treat and damage the veins, and they take time to regress and to shrink and to go away. And sometimes what we'll see is there will be a little bit of trapped blood in there, and so that'll take some time also to fade away. So the advantage of this procedure is it's a five-minute procedure with a tiny little butterfly needle, like a needle that you would use to get a, a blood drawn. But the downside is that it just takes a little bit more time for those veins to really shrink. Another way that I've been using uh, this, and it's been such a great uh, tool, uh, is to treat stubborn venous stasis ulcers. And so what I've been using it uh, for is I've been directly injecting right into the bed of the ulcer. Right in that bed, if you go ahead and you did an ultrasound examination, you would see small little veins. And those little veins are causing that pressure and causing that irritation to keep the venous stasis ulcers open. And so I target right in the, the belly of the ulcer uh, small little needle under ultrasound guidance, get right in there and uh, put in the uh, Varathena. And th these, are the, these are kind of the dramatic uh, changes that we're seeing. Uh, we're seeing um, clear benefit in uh, healing uh, compared to, um, you know, before I used this. Like some patients, we would go ahead and use all the tools that I had that I have discussed already, uh, but there would be just these stubborn uh, branches of these veins may be arising from perforators. Uh, now we can target directly right in the ulcer bed. So this has been uh, really helpful for our patients here at Contract. So in conclusion, so interventional radiology, you know, similar or improved uh, procedure outcomes compared to conventional treatments. Uh, you know, definitely talk to your doctor about options uh, for managing uh, disease processes, uh, you, you'd be surprised we, we might be uh, an option. Uh, varicose veins is a large emerging market here in Concord. Uh, I still hear sometimes patients going elsewhere, uh, but you know, I've been here for five years uh, offering this service line. I have two other physicians with me that are dedicated to treating patients here in this community, so uh, I hope that you know, more people become aware of the options that they, they can have locally. And uh, some of that, I guess, is what we're doing today and on Facebook and in the Concord Monitor, so people are aware of, of, of how we can have uh, you know, a, a definite positive outcome for patients that suffer from venous disease. And uh, you know, we, we have the latest and greatest here at Concord Hospital, and 
I, you know, I, I'm very pleased with how interventional radiology is growing. And uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a state-of-the-art room in a few few months, and it's going to be exciting to see the new procedures that we could potentially do with that room. One exciting procedure would be prostate embolization. Mm -hmm. Instead of undergoing surgery to treat benign prosthetic hypertrophy, we can go into the vessels to go ahead and shrink the prostate down, so you wouldn't need uh, conventional surgery. Uh, yeah, and uh, intervention is critical for our community, and, and we've proved that already in the past five years here. Thank you.